Hey, who's got the ad? Welcome to another episode of All Nostalgic Television, and welcome to the Secret Ant Cave along with the Wayback Time Machine. I'm your host, Doug Heum. In this episode... Hey, what did you say your name was, Doug Heum? Oh, it's you. How'd you get Never in here? Never mind that. And don't start with that ain't I you routine. <laughs> What's the matter with you? You got bugs on your no, liver? No, but I see a bug in the ant cave and I'm kicking it out What of did here. I do? You mispronounced your own name. Fine, like you've never made a mistake. Anyway, welcome to the Ant. I'm your host, Doug Heim. Before we do anything, I want to make an apology for a blooper I made in the last episode. When I introduced Jay Johnson and Danielle Bina for a news feature about Barney of Barney's Clubhouse POW, I mispronounced Danielle's name. I've already apologized to Danielle personally, but I also wanted to say I'm sorry publicly. Speaking of bloopers, this episode is going to be full of them. And here's just a preview. Oh, let's see here. Uh, and I forgot. I don't know. I forgot. <laughs> and also uh, nuts. Good evening, Earth. I'm Ray Wheeler. Dad, you hear about the one-armed fisherman? Well, the weather. <laughs> no precipitation. No clouds. Nothing at all. It's just getting dark tonight. Well, that's just a peek at some of the bloopers coming up in this episode. Plus, I have more stories to share with you from historic TV icons Tom Hutchinson and Bob Schultz. And, of course, another mystery picture. Now, do you remember in the last episode I mentioned who Jerry Drake was and that he was Green Bay, Wisconsin's very own Bozo the Clown? Well, here's the proof. This is a rare photo of Jerry Drake as Bozo the Clown. I'd like to thank Greg Binns for providing this image. And who's Greg Binns? Retiring in 2020, Greg was a 42-year employee at WLUK TV 11. Here's Greg in TV 11's master control, the very same control room where the original TJ and the Ant was broadcast from. In 1978, Greg started as a cameraman and over the years worked his way up to shooting hockey and football games and then directing newscasts, MDA telethons, Christmas Eve masses, and Golden Apple Awards, Living with Amy, and Good Day Wisconsin. Congratulations, Greg, on an outstanding and fantastic career. I also have an update from Episode 2. Remember, in that episode, I mentioned two teenage kids that were guests on the original Ant and that they had made an 8mm animated film using G.I. Joe dolls. The two teenage animators, John and Joe Bulky, took actual G.I. Joe dolls and animated them performing a Beatles tune. It was pretty incredible. In that episode, I also mentioned that I wondered where John and Joe are today. Well, guess what? They saw the episode and contacted me to let me know that they are both alive and doing well. And now to answer some viewers' questions. Question number one, do I make any money producing these shows? The answer is no. And I'm retired now, so I do this only for preservation and pleasure. And if this broadcast ever generates any revenue, I'll donate all of it after paying any copyrights. Question number two, when are the new episodes of The Ant released? The answer is at midnight on the first of every month, right here on YouTube. And question number three. Do I have any old film or video of a WBAY TV2 pre-TJ and the Ant late night TV show called Erie Street? 
The answer is yes. You are looking at an original promo slide for the show, and the host of Erie Street was Alexander. The show aired on Friday nights on TV2 from 1971 to 1973. And even better than that, I was able to track down Alexander himself and have an Ant Cam interview with him, and it's coming up later in this episode. Coming up shortly, I have more Ant Cam stories from Tom Hutchinson and Bob Schultz. And this time, they talk about the Bart Starr Show and sports announcer Jim Irwin. But first, it's time for this episode's mystery picture. And to do that, we'll have to set the Wayback Machine to the year 1978. <laughs> And now, here is this episode's mystery picture. It's an extreme close-up of something, but what? And remember, it's a little tricky because this picture was taken of something in 1978. See if you can guess what it is. I'll slowly zoom out and give you clues throughout the episode. And I'll give you the answer at the end. It's now time for more Ant Cam stories with Tom Hutchinson and Bob Schultz. Uh, Bart, well, Bart became the head coach, and it, is, it was a tough job for him. And he did a wonderful job with it. But it was a time when people were being very critical of the coaching staff. And he was very cool, very good when he saw this job he did with TV. It was outstanding. But they came in one night, he and Cherry would come in together and we'd go over the highlights of that night's show. And, uh, and one night they came in, she pulled me aside and said, Bob, we have to talk. You can't be talking to Bart like you're his best friend and then being critical on the news half an hour ahead of that. So I thought, well, they're going to take the show away. And no, they didn't. What we agreed to, we continued to produce the show. We just hired somebody else to co-host it with Bart. I got to add one thing, though. Yeah. Jim Irwin was probably the only, the best known personality we had in the market. And he loved to do play-by-play. -play. So he would go with the players. When he started, he was very conscious of his uh, expenses. So when we had an all-star game in Chicago, and we, Irwin and uh, Ken Davis, our salesman, went down, and Jim came back and he, he said he, he was bored, he didn't have it, he didn't even go out to eat with the client. Well, Ken Davis came back and said the client was very disappointed that Irwin did, didn't attend the festivities. So I called Irwin in and I said, from here on out, when you go with a client, you're expected to entertain them. And in the 50 years I was in business, Irwin never again disappointed me with a very meager expense account. He was the best of the world. I'll have more stories from Bob and Tom in future episodes. It's blooper time, and what you're about to see next were never intended to be broadcast on television. Some of what you were about to see were mistakes that were never actually aired, and some did. The first batch of bloopers take place in 1979, so let's set the Wayback Machine to that year. Well, here come the bloopers, and the stuff I love the best is when the production is almost perfect until the end. Red Bunny and Hutter. Red Bunny and Hutter. Hi, I'm TV 11. <laughs> I'm Sue Davis tonight. From the Ice Arena at the Fond du Lac Fairgrounds. Good afternoon, everyone. It's the fourth annual McDonald's Invitation Youth Hockey Tournament. The contenders this afternoon for the Squirt Championship 
the peer against, and I forgot. <laughs> right now we're reporting a little bit of drizzle in La Crosse. But drizzle was about all we had during the day. Precipitation total in Green Bay was seven hundredths of an inch. What we have is temperature-wise, 40s in the north, 50s over the rest of the state, with a 63 our high in Green Bay, seven degrees below what we average would get would get average for today. Let's take a look at the forecast. Northeastern Wisconsin tonight, <laughs> below what we average would get would get average for today. Good evening. Here is a TV 11 news break. I'm Ray Wheeler. Senator William Proxmire wants uh, a special prosecutor to investigate Treasury Secretary William Miller. Proxmire wants to find out if Miller lied to Congress two years ago. Miller denied any knowledge of Textron's payments overseas when he was a company chairman. Senator Alan Cranston of California says President Carter's plans for draft registration won't help our military readiness. He says it could also pointlessly disrupt millions of lives. The Soviet Union has some reluctant allies. North Korea and Romania today refused to back the Russian... Uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, Good evening. Here is a TV 11 news break. I'm Ray Wheeler. Senator William Proxmire wants a special investigator to look into... No, that's not quite right either. Good evening. Here is a TV 11 news break. I'm Ray Wheeler. Senator William Proxmire wants a special prosecutor to investigate Treasury Secretary William Miller. Proxmire wants to find out if Miller lied to Congress two years ago. Miller denied any knowledge of Textron's illegal payments overseas when he was company chairman. Senator Alan Cranston of California says President Carter's plans for draft registration won't meet our military needs. He said it could also pointlessly disrupt millions of lives. The Soviet Union has some reluctant allies. North Korea and Romania today refused to back Russia's occupation of Afghanistan. The U.S. hostages in Tehran were visited today by Aya Khomeini's and that's not right either. Heavier snow showers this evening were still falling from Manitowoc and Sheboygan down through M Milwaukee and Chicago. They should be dissipating after midnight or by sunrise tomorrow morning. Still a few snow flurries around Eau Claire and also on, around the Upper Peninsula region. They too should be dissipating during tomorrow afternoon. The forecast for late tonight and tomorrow, partly cloudy and cold with a chance of Uh, some, what I'm, for what I told, it's some type of a sequel from, uh, uh, oh, let's see here, uh, how come I can't think of the name of it? Maybe I should have wrote it down, but anyway. Sue Davies, late night weather. Not much change tomorrow from today, and that doesn't make a lot of sense, but let's talk anyway about it. Can we do it again? <laughs> a foggy wood, a wooing go high. Good. Heavier snow showers will continue tonight over much. <laughs> no, you, you have to wait till the end. Heavier snow squalls will continue tonight over much of southern portions of Lake Superior and Upper Michigan. I blew that. Let's do it again. Good evening. It's time now for a TV 11 news break. I'm Ray Wheeler. More people died in motorcycle accidents in the state of Wisconsin in 1979 than in any other year. The number 123 dead. The straight transportation department also nuts. Mostly cloudy skies continued over much of the upper Midwest during the late evening hours. Some light snow was also falling over much of the central and northern Wisconsin and most of upper Michigan. This will continue to be the. I don't know. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> some only light scattered snow likely for the next few days. There could be some more significant snow. <laughs> Come on! Those clouds which were rolling in the Minnesota early... Shit. Minnesota, dude! God! <laughs> <laughs> Skies were common throughout much of northeastern Wisconsin, eastern portions of upper... upper <laughs> Some light snow showers in the far northwestern portions of Wisconsin through around the Ironwood, Hurley, and, and Houghton.
with highs a bit warmer, 8 to 18 degrees, and then Tuesday and Wednesday, occasional flurries with highs in the 20s. So it looks like it's going to stay cold. As they say on Saturday Night Live, what's the weather like for bees? Is that what they say? I could. They used to or say we could do the samurai weather if you prefer. Something like that. Well, the bees are in a bind. There are those who consider them trespassers, like the canning companies and the farmers. Then there are those like Bob Bennett, the beekeeper, who for them, the bees are bread bunny and hutter. Bread bunny and hutter. Bread bunny and hutter. You know, compared to the rest of the country, this has been like summertime for us. East Coast is still being battered by that terrible winter storm. We are living under an Arctic high pressure that's going to keep our skies fair to partly cloudy. Dip those temperatures down. Let's check the forecast. For Upper Michigan tonight, mostly cloudy with occasional flurries near Lake Superior, Wisconsin. Cloudy and chance of flurries. On Saturday in the UP, partly cloudy, few flurries near Lake Superior, 17 to 23. Wisconsin, cloudy early, and then Sunday by the afternoon. Temperatures tomorrow in the 20s, a very nice day. WLUK, TV 11, this is Green Bay. Well, the weather... <laughs> weather around our area hasn't been all that bad, but tonight the temperatures are going to dip way down there. We can thank that Arctic high pressure that's coming into our area, causing those temperatures to go down. Now that storm that was in the Central Plains has not yet reached us, and if we're lucky, it looks like it's going to bypass us, so we're not going to get the really horrible, heavy accumulations of snow. I think we've had enough about now. Let's call that forecast then about like this. <laughs> Good evening, Earth. I'm Ray Wheeler. Our top story tonight is about a new development in Appleton's redevelopment. Terry Jessup has details at TV 11's Valley Bureau in Appleton. Fondy's Emil Mosey called in a big one at Green Lake today. A 22-pound, one-ounce lake trout five days early for the Bud Norton Memorial Fishery this weekend. Sorry, Bob. I fell asleep during your sports there. I... <laughs> Well, let me find a page here. Uh, uh, re recap. What's, the, what's the weather recap? Well, hey, windy and bitter cold conditions continuing. Maybe another one to three inches by tomorrow morning. 70 degrees, no way. All right, that's it for tonight. Our good night comes from a lousy beauty school in Green Bay. <laughs> we'll see you at 10. Now it's time for Bill Beagle and some fish stories. Yeah, did you hear about the one-armed fisherman? Walked to the bait shop, the guy says, catch anything? He says, yeah, I got one this big. <laughs> <laughs> It was a lot different than opening day 1980. Despite poor water quality, you couldn't see for nothing down there in Lake Winnebago. There were a lot of big sturgeon taken out of there, the spearing. Yes, Big Al is with one of the fellows down in the valley right now. We got one of the biggest ones today, good old MB Dot Chick. Those Polish guys sure can chuck spears. Al? We went out there for about an hour and a half, two hours, and come back in with one. He was nervous. You should have seen the fish. Hey, yeah, the DNR plans to sell more licenses Monday. If you don't have one, don't try to spear them until because they'll bust you. And here now with a look at the TV 11 weather is Sue Davies. Thank you very much, Terry. How do you like Wisconsin weather thus far? Much too cold for me, to be honest. Sorry about that. More cold weather coming. Let's take a look at our national map. But we'll start with currents. 36 degrees, that's one degree on the Celsius scale. Humidity, 72%. A falling barometer, southwesterly winds at 10 miles per hour. Well, it's a good thing our weather today was in the southern half of the United States because that's all I can reach. Up north, nothing much happening. But down here, temperatures were in the 70s and 80s, and we have a lot of brown, a lot of ground that was left dry today because there wasn't a lot in the way of rain. We take a look at our regional maps. We see that there's not much happening, no precipitation, no clouds, nothing at all. It's just getting dark tonight. And our temperatures, if we pull those back, we can see that not a lot happening there either. Just a lot of good weather should continue through the weekend. And now let's get to our forecast. Tonight, northeastern Wisconsin, it looks like this. 
tonight through Monday, fair nights and partly cloudy days. Our temperatures will be very comfortable, 23 to 28 degrees for the lows, highs 36 to 40 degrees. Southerly winds 5 to 15 miles per hour tonight. Southwesterly winds 10 to 20 miles per hour on Sunday. And looking at tonight in UP, mostly cloudy skies, lows will be near 20 degrees, a warm day in the UP tomorrow, partly sunny skies, highs 36 to 40 degrees. Our outlook for Tuesday and Wednesday, showers possible, that probably will be in the form of rain, possibly the, some snow in northern part of Wisconsin, highs 35 to 45 degrees. So it looks like we're having our typical February thaw. So what you're saying, mostly dark tonight and light by morning. That's what I'm saying, Terry. I'm glad you summed it up like that. Thank you, Sue. Well, Valentine's Day is just one of those special days that everybody loves to celebrate, but TV11's Tom Cott says it is also a day to watch out for. The candle's over there. Was on that camera all the time? <laughs> Bizarre bank robbery in Lomira this afternoon. About 3 o'clock, a man walked into the Valley Bank and told the teller to give him all the money. The teller thought he had a gun in his pocket, so she handed over the money and the bank robber got away with $19,000 in cash. But less than 25 minutes later, the robber returned to the bank, so police arrested him and recovered all of the money. There's no word yet on why the man bothered to rob the bank in the first place. A government informer, Henry Hill, says that he paid three Boston College players to shave points during the 1978-79 season. The three players made $10,000 each for attempting to fix nine games. A new page for the Guinness Book of World Records. Last Friday, Weather Will said the temperature would not go above zero on Wednesday. How high did it get today? Zero. That's incredible. We had nothing in Green Bay this afternoon. By tomorrow morning, some places up north may be 30 below. So we'll have even less than nothing. That's true. Yeah. Hey, right now in Green Bay, we're looking at a temperature of around 13 degrees below zero. For Friday and Saturday, partly cloudy. The good news, it will be warmer with a chance of some more light snow. The highs will be in the teens north and 20s across the south. Here's your forecast, Ray, personally, from Weather Well. Sounds like spring is on the way. Definitely Thank so. Thank you so much. Here is a partial zoom out and a clue of this episode's mystery picture. Don't forget, the image was taken in 1978. You're looking at something that is usually found hanging on a wall. You can find one in almost any home or building. And it's something you hope you'll never need. See if you can figure out what it is. I'll have the answer at the end. Well. There are more bloopers to come. I actually struggled whether to let you see what you are about to see or destroy it forever. Well, you'll see what I decided in a moment. Can you picture me as a cowboy? I don't want to be a cowboy. Well, guess what? I was, and what a blooper that was. I was supposed to host a country western TV show called North Country. The year was 1987, and country music was most popular at that time. Now let's set the Wayback Machine to that year. Whew. Everything you are about to see is a blooper. I can't believe I actually did what I did. You are about to see me as a blooper cowboy. At the time, I owned a production company, and we were trying to develop and produce a country music television show titled North Country. In the process, we created a demo pilot for the show, and you'll see the bloopers from that demo, and then you'll see the demo itself. And like I said, everything was a blooper. The TV show bombed and we never got a sponsor. So, are you ready for a good laugh? Well, here's blooper cowboy Doug Heim. Heim. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed our demonstration of North Country and consider using it for a... 
Well, I hope you enjoyed North Country. It's a... Well, I hope you enjoyed this small demonstration of North Country. There are also other segments in the show that we were not able to show you, such as... Uh, Well, I hope you enjoyed our small demo, our small demo. Well, I hope you enjoyed our demonstration of North Country. Now, in weeks... Three, two, one. Well, I hope you enjoyed our demonstration of North Country. Well, I hope you enjoyed our little demo on North Country. Okay. Enough blooper cowboy, and I hope you had a good laugh. Now get ready. You are about to see the six and a half minute demo that we produced. It was a blooper of an idea, and it has never been broadcast until now. I might regret this, but here you go. Hello, I'm Doug Heim. The following is a video demonstration of a television show called North Country. It's a country western music and dance show, but for the sake of this video demo, it has been edited down. Howdy everyone, and welcome to North Country. Today we're coming from Danceland Ballroom in Green Bay, Wisconsin, with our featured band from Wasop Southern Comfort, with special guests Fiddle and Andy Sanders and Louie Tash. North Country is brought to you by Mills Fleet Farm, Miller Beer, Shopco Stores, and the Cross Country Kickers. And now, here's your host for North Country, Doug Hyde. Thank you and hello everyone. Welcome to this week's North Country. Right now, let's give a warm welcome to our feature band for this week, Southern Comfort. We met a promise right from the start. I've had problems in bed and dead. There's life left in this body, yeah. Gotta meet me a woman. Meet me a woman. Me a woman. Hey, gotta meet me a woman. Southern Comfort, our feature band on this week's North Country, and we'll have more from Southern Comfort a little bit later on. In weeks to come, right here on North Country, we'll be featuring performers from Nashville, Tennessee, and the Grand Ole Opera, as well as guest disc jockeys from country western radio stations from all over the area. Now, don't go away, because coming up, we have our special guest, fiddling Andy Sanders from Green Bay. And welcome back to North Country. If you just joined us, we're coming to you from Danceland Ballroom in Green Bay for this week's show. Also on Thursday nights out here at Danceland, the Cross Country Kickers have dance lessons going on if you'd like to join them for that from 7.30 until 9 o'clock. Right now, it's time for our special guest star, fiddle and Andy Sanders from Green Bay, Wisconsin, doing old Joel Clark along with the Southern Comfort Band from Wausau. Take it away, Andy.
Randy Sanders doing a song called Old Joel Clark right here on North Country. Now, don't go away because we have another special guest coming up, the father of Gene and Tim Tash from the Southern Comfort Band, Louis Tash, right after this break. My eyes keep searching for you. Louis Tash from Wausau, Wisconsin, doing an old Eddie Arnold number called Cattle Call. Well, we hope you enjoyed this week's show. Next week, our feature band will be the Mark Bournes Band. He and his boys have been playing all over this region of the United States. And we also hope that you will join us for our next TV taping, which will be taking place at the Haystack in Wausau, Wisconsin. Well, as we leave you on this week's North Country, once again, here's our feature band for this week's show, Southern Comfort doing Everyone's Talking At Me. Everybody's talking at me Don't know what they're saying Only the echoes of their mind People stop and stare Don't even see their faces Only the shadows of their eyes the next North Country TV taping will take place at Danceland Ballroom in Green Bay on Saturday, June 15th, and at the Haystack in Wausau on July 11th. Go where the weather suits my clothes. North Country has been brought to you by Mills Fleet Farm, Shopco Stores, and Miller Beer. Well, I hope you enjoyed this demonstration of our TV show, North Country. Now, because it's only in its pilot stages, we were not able to show you such things as interviews with the bands, guest disc jockeys from radio station, special dance segments, and comedians. This TV show will be taped wherever we're broadcasting this show. In other words, if we're broadcasting this show in your city, we will make engagements to come to your area to tape special segments of North Country. North Country is a production of Tell Audio Productions Incorporated, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Call us collect for more information. Our phone number is area code 414-432-7888. Well, the show never happened. And Tell Audio, by the way, was a production company I started with Bill LeMay in late 1985. And at the time, Bill was a very popular radio personality on WIXX. When we launched Tell Audio, we produced a promo for that as well. And you'll see that right after another clue of this episode's mystery picture. Here is a partial zoom out and a clue of this episode's mystery picture. Don't forget, the image was taken in 1978. You're looking at something that is usually found hanging on a wall. There should be one in every home, boat, camper, or building. In some cases, it's something required to have on hand by law. And it's something you hope you'll never need. The answer is coming later. Well, as I said, Bill LeMay and myself started a production company in 1985, so let's set the Wayback Machine to that year. Whew. In 1985, I got myself in debt up to my eyeballs and started a video production company with Bill. We spent tens of thousands of dollars on what was the latest and greatest TV cameras and editing equipment. We also bought the latest audio production equipment and built our studios. And by the way, we were the region's first video production company to be technically tied to a complete audio production facility. Hence the name Tell Audio. Get it? Television Audio. As you watch the promo, you will see some of the commercials and productions that we created. And pay attention to the old technology. At the time, it was state of the art.
The following is a presentation of Tell Audio Productions. Tell Audio Productions is the first independent production house to offer complete audio and video facilities under one roof. This makes it more convenient for you to coordinate your advertising and presentation projects. We in turn can serve you faster with a superior quality product. Our engineers have 22 years of radio and television experience. You can be sure your project will be handled carefully and professionally. We can also help with concepting, scripting, casting and directing everything from initial idea to completed product we started tell audio with one intention to create the finest video and audio products in this area at a price that won't inflate your bottom line we have the equipment the system and the experience to make it all happen for you tell audio you'll see and you'll hear the difference Our audio facility features full 8-track capabilities with all the whistles and bells you need. DBX, digital delay, equalization, reverb, compression, and more. Our video production facility features AB Synchro editing and a computer editor controller with frame-by-frame -frame editing. Digital time-based correctors with special effects such as freeze frame and various strobe effects. A 12-input audio board with audio patch bay. Monitors for all sources. Waveform monitor at director's control. Video switcher with up and down screen keying. Hard and soft edge border or color border wipes and backgrounds. Our character generator is the Chiron VP1. Controlled with separate computer. Its abilities are almost endless. You're going to remember graduation day like this. Maybe it's time you graduated to this, a new camcorder. And nobody has a camcorder sale like Piarkey's Camcorder Price Cut Weekend. Graduate to a camcorder. Get smart savings. It's number one in its class. The Camcorder Weekend Sale through Sunday at Piarkey's. The Superstores with service. Six WAPL going down in history as the Valley's home of rock and roll. And every Canon and Harris 3M copier is backed by our sales and service departments with over 31 years of experience. Until now, there was no way you could be certain your scope was on when you were in the field. But today, there's a remarkable new device which allows you to sight in your scope perfectly. Good job, gang. That's a wrap. Let's fade it to black. As I said earlier, we started Tell Audio in late 1985. But earlier that same year, Bill LeMay teamed up with me to create what we called the Mock Rock Lip Sync Contest. I was already producing a TV dance show on WXGZ TV 32 called The Dance Machine. The show was basically people dancing on TV. So we thought, why not kick it up a notch? Here's a video when I was with Bill at WIXX recording a promo for the contest. We explain the prizes and how it was all supposed to work. And of course, it starts out with a blooper. The new prizes. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I lost my place, so I can do an edit here. Uh, uh, yeah, real quick. 
I wanted to mention that, uh, you know, you can listen to IXX. It'll keep you posted can each day. Yeah, go ahead. Welcome back. Before we leave you this week, uh, Bill and I are going to fill you in a little bit about how the uh, Mock Rock Lip Sync Contest works. There's been a lot of questions uh, from everyone on how to get entry forms and uh, how the contest works. Bill, you want to explain a little of that? Okay, the contest is real easy. Now, the dance machine will be in cities throughout northeast Wisconsin, uh, taping in local establishments. Now, chances are we're going to be close to you if we're not in your city. Now, each night, everybody who lip syncs has opportunity to, to win some prizes. The winner will go on to the semifinals. From there, the winner will represent their city in the finals on May 3rd at the Carlton uh, Celebrity Room. Right. Now, as the contest works right now, uh, all the judging is being done by crowd response. And on the finals on May 3rd, there'll be judges brought in. Bill LeMay, you're going to be one of the judges? A judge, yes. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. And the uh, judging will be done on lip sync, stage appearance, and uh, originality, as well as uh, crowd reaction. And I want to stress, too, that if... Uh, uh, you're interested in getting into this contest and you have your entry forms, where do you send them? You can send them to the dance machine. Here is our address. I'll leave it on the screen for a few moments here. The dance machine is located at 1638 University Avenue, Green Bay, Wisconsin, 54302. Uh, if you would otherwise like to just walk in uh, the night that the dance machine is taping, we will take walk-in. So if you have your entry form all filled out and you decide that night uh, when the dance machine is in your area to do the con uh, competition, that we will take walk-ins. Uh, the other note here is if you're under the age of 18, we have to have parental consent and also you can only perform in one of the teen establishments that the dance machine tapes at, which is the Kaleidoscope in Freedom, Gojo's in Nina, and uh, Beyond Activity Center in Green Bay. Uh, and also some of the prizes we have. Well, we have a thousand dollar vacation package along with the services of the dance machine for for one night. We have a five hundred dollar VCR from Camera Corner and a two hundred dollar watch from Armin's. Right, and uh, we'll be mentioning that each week on the show. Uh, a lot of the prizes that are being sponsored. Uh, also, you each night if you get confused as to where the dance machine is taping, that you can listen to WIXX Radio, and each day you guys will be telling everyone, updating uh, everybody, telling you where you're going to be and what time and uh, so stay tuned yeah we'll keep you informed and also you're going to have a chance to meet bill uh, lemay himself in person because you're going to be going along in yeah, a couple I'm going of to be tagging along with you once a week anyway so eventually i'll hit every city and i'm looking forward to it all right real good bill it's been going great uh, here's where the dance machine will be going this coming week today we'll be at gojo's teen scene in nina and uh, then, of course, tomorrow night at Utopia. We were not there last Monday, but we will be there tomorrow night to kick off the uh, Mock Rock contest. Tuesday night, it's at Frankie's in downtown Menasha once again. And, of course, Wednesday at the Back 40 in Manitowoc. Thursday, we're at the King James in Shano. And Friday night, Beyond Activity Center in Green Bay. And Saturday at the Kaleidoscope in Freedom. And uh, we suggest, too, that you get into this contest as early as possible because as the con uh, con competition goes on, uh, more and more contestants are getting in. And uh, uh, the more there are, of course, the more... Uh, competition there is. Big announcement, March 23rd, the dance machine will be for the first time in a town called Peshtigo. Uh, we're going to be taping at a place called Cressel, so we're looking forward to that. Bill LeMay, thank you very much for being on the show. Hey, thanks, Doug. It was a lot of fun. Let's do it again. All right, real good. Right. That's it for this week. We'll see you next week. The Mock Rock Lip Sync Finals took place at the Carlton Dinner Theater in Green Bay on Friday, May 3rd, 1985. The show was an hour long and featured hundreds of contestants performing a total of 41 different acts. No one was actually a star or a famous singer. All the contestants were average everyday people from northeastern Wisconsin. Here are all 41 acts in 60 seconds. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's the WIXX TV 32 Mock Rock Lip Sync Finals. Here's Doug Heim.
It all took place at the Carlton Dinner Theater in Green Bay, Wisconsin on May 3, 1985. You will see the entire Mock Rock Lip Sync Finals in the next episode of All Nostalgic Television. It's now time for the Ant Cam interview with Alexander of Erie Street. On Friday nights from 1971 to 1973, WBAY TV2 aired a program called Erie Street. A ghoulish host named Alexander would rise up out of a coffin and introduce the horror movie for that night as well as pitch commercial breaks and promote the next week's movie. And now, here is the Ant Cam interview with Al Gatowski, the host of Erie Street. Hello everyone, and I'm really excited because sitting next to me is a historic television icon, Alexander from Erie Street on WBAY TV 2. Welcome. Thanks, Doug. I don't know about historic icon, but okay. Trust me, he is. Now I want to get into Al Gatowski. When did you get into television at all? I mean, you, you were a kid growing up. Did you grow up in Green Bay? Grew up in Green Bay. Um, <clears throat> did you ever, when you were a kid, did television fascinate you in any way? Did you think that one day I want to work in the television industry? Not at all. The way it worked out is uh, I was, uh, as I said, born and raised in Green Bay. And uh, as I was going to school, uh, I went to, was going to college at the uh, University of Wisconsin Green Bay. And I had a bunch of friends uh, that were also there, but had picked up part-time jobs uh, at WBAY uh, in the uh, production area. And uh, those guys uh, mentioned to me that it might be a good idea that I believe at the time they were uh, looking for people to, uh, to join the crew. And it was in 1969, um, I came on board. I started in production uh, working on the floor crew, which is different than the way things go now. You worked on the floor crew, you worked with uh, getting sets set up for live action programs that How happened were during you then? the day. In what year? Well, that would have, it would have been 69, I was 19. Just a kid. Uh, well, yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So I was going to school full time at GB and it turned out that I was working uh, on the production crew almost full-time, pulling more than 30-some uh, hours. And after a while, it was a full-time job, full-time school, full-time job. And uh, I remained at WBAY for about 16 years before we broke off to create the, uh, our advertising marketing firm. Cool. Now, when you got uh, a job at a TV station, you're 19 years old, uh, and they come up with this idea of doing a late night, Friday night horror show and they need a host. Of all the people and employees they had at BAY, why you? To tell you the truth, I really don't know, but the only thing uh, that I can guess at was the fact that at the time, and I still do have a beard, much more close cropped this, these days <laughs> and a lot uh, grayer, <laughs> uh, but at the time, uh, a beard kind of scraggly and uh, um, not unkempt, but uh, uh, that would be a guess. And I was on the floor crew, and the, uh, uh, the talent was cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably <laughs> most likely the, the reason. So anyway, what an exciting opportunity. You're a young guy. You get to be a host of a, uh, a kind of a corny 
uh, concept, but it, 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 it's made its landmark. And so you, you tell everybody a little bit about what Erie Street was like. I mean, meaning you got up out of a coffin and you, you had a cape which you brought with you today, which believe it or not, the cape you had when you hosted that show, you still have today, and you, he even brought it with him today. Yep, it was uh, hanging down in the basement in uh, a closed storage bag, <laughs> and uh, it comes out every once in a great while for like Halloween. Oh, sure. But other than that, no, it stays down there. It's uh, been around for quite a while. Uh, the whole idea, it was basically uh, a WBAY uh, effort. Uh, there were a lot of people that were working here at the time that helped make this happen. Of course, on the production crew, I became the host. And then we had uh, uh, people that were working. Um, we actually had individuals that uh, built sets. I mean, you had sets that were being constructed, that were being used to create commercials, to have live shows. There was a live cooking show, a live exercise show in the morning, uh, the noon show, all kinds of things. And each one of those needed backdrops and scenery. Well, once Erie Street came up, we had uh, the guys, uh, if I remember correctly, Jim Nowicki and Bill Jokey, um, who is actually, Bill Jokey is uh, quite an accomplished uh, sculptor, artist uh, these days. I haven't been in touch with them for quite some time. But they created, uh, built a coffin that we painted black that I could rise from. There was a signpost that was built that said Erie Street. And we utilized that with uh, lighting in the studio uh, to create uh, the effects where I could walk through. Everything was basically back and then highlighted with the Erie Street sign or the coffin. And, and I would come out and kind of write my own copy uh, with regards to what the movie was, uh, if there was you know, some tongue-in-cheek pun or whatever that you could introduce, or at the time that it was going on and had some following, um, you would get letters from kids that were watching, and uh, you'd write that into the, the, the copy where you'd mention something about somebody wrote in and thank you or whatever, and, uh, basically did that type of thing. So a lot of people involved in creating the, uh, the background. Uh, the cape itself was put together by the mother of one of the, uh, the people that was working here, Lynette Nowak. She was in uh, sales service, which is essentially people that were working to write and produce commercials at the time. Uh, and her mom, uh, sewn the, uh, the outfit, uh, the cape, and I've had it ever since. So there were a lot of people that got Where involved in putting you, that together. You got the cape here somewhere? Uh, in the background, sitting on the table. I'm gonna go get it. Oh. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here it is. This is the actual cape that Alexander of Erie Street uh, wore when he hosted Erie Street. Yep, that still exists, so it's wow. lovingly kept in the, <laughs> in this the basement. Is really, this is really amazing. I mean, really, this is, somebody put some serious work into this thing. She uh, did a very nice job, and it worked out well. Um, I basically wore just black underneath it, you know, like a turtle net. Kind of like what I'm wearing. <laughs> black slacks, yep. and then just put this over uh, the top, and then uh, as things progressed, there were actually some requests to come out and visit. So I visited a couple of schools as uh, the Alexander persona, and uh, that was kind of fun, you know. Cool. This thing, thing belongs in the museum, folks. I'm telling you, of, of Green Bay television history, this thing is a, is a landmark heirloom. Call it what you will. Hmm. By well, the way, when you first did Erie Street, you, hmm. had, you said you, uh, I, I saw an article that you wore makeup. Uh, I and did, because at the time I didn't know um, how best to uh, create that persona. And I thought that would be good to do to wear a little bit. But after a while, it, you know, especially if you're going out, um, out into public, you know, it, it 
became kind of hard, you know, to when do you apply makeup and when do you get rid of it if you're driving around or whatever. And it uh, basically morphed into a situation where I didn't wear makeup. I just, the costume did it and... Uh, the lighting. And the lighting. That sure. was basically it. Uh, as opposed to uh, another one of our, you know, the genre, uh, as, you know, like yourself, TJ and the Ant, uh, Steve Brunzel, Ned the Dead, you know, he's still around and uh, he has the makeup that he wears as his, you know, with his persona and still does that. And you'll see him out in public, but, you know, yeah, I just got away from that, so. Yeah, I'd like to, I got you on the show. I'd like to get Steve Brenzel on the show. We're all late night TV celebrities from Green Bay and uh, Misty Blue, and she, uh, uh, she was on Channel 26, I believe, and she's probably the only other one that I can think of as a Green Bay late night TV uh, host of sorts. Personality, right, yeah. right. So, speaking about being a celebrity and being out in the public, as you were mentioning with your makeup and whether you wear it or not, um, being a celebrity, now I know what it's like. Share your, your experiences of uh, being a celebrity in Green Bay, Wisconsin, a television celebrity. Um, you got asked, asked well, for autographs. You went. You made appearances at at uh, schools and. Yes, but that was really, in my estimation, a minor portion. Um, it was like a little bit more than 15 minutes of fame. Maybe I got 25. <laughs> I never considered uh, myself to be a uh, a celebrity. Uh, there was a little bit of notoriety, you know, where. We created uh, basically uh, a photograph giveaway that if I did go out to a school or something, you know, you could give that away. It had my, uh, my, my signature and uh, a picture of Alexander from Erie Street. But that was pretty short-lived. Uh, there were occasions where somebody might recognize you and uh, that was uh, gratifying. Um, but basically, that was few and far between. So you didn't have any really good experiences or bad no, experiences? No, the good experience was being able to do that for, you know, just under two years. Uh, being able to be, uh, to be recognized and have some information. There's uh, kind of a, a kind of what I consider a cute story that uh, my wife, uh, at the time when this was going on, um, she was, you know, obviously a, a young woman and going out uh, wherever and uh, came in uh, uh, to her home and her brother was watching Erie Street that night and she evidently walked in and said something to the effect, and I'll paraphrase, what are you watching that weird guy for? Not realizing that uh, it wasn't all that much longer uh, that uh, she would be married to that guy. H had she met you yet? No. No. So, so when she saw you on TV, she had never met you yet? No. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, that was something else. We get a kick over uh, talking about that. I bet. So why did Erie Street come to an end so soon? Because you went off the air four years before TJ and the Ant went on the air. So I think late night Friday night was a hot potato. So why would it end so abruptly? Uh, not necessarily... Uh, and abruptly, you know, I can't speak to it directly. I can kind of uh, guess as to what that happened. Uh, at that time, you would buy movie packages. Oh, I know now that. You, you buy a movie package and you only have it for, for so, so long. long yeah. And I think that uh, basically, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I would say that is what happened. A movie package was purchased, uh, the license uh, came up and ended, and you know, you just go on to other things. Yeah, and I can also vouch that late night TV in Green Bay was not a, a money maker. In other words, when I ran the late night movies, I ran five movies all night long and probably five commercials in seven hours. So it's not, I mean, TV makes its money by selling airtime. And during the all night theater, we didn't sell much airtime, but we sure made an audience. That's all I don't know. And of course, you know, at, uh, uh, Late night didn't go all night as your show did. Right, not yet. It, yeah, it uh, basically just uh, after you did the uh, the news blocks, you know, you had early news at six o'clock, late news at ten, 
And after that, a lot of the stations, especially uh, WBAY on many nights, would air a, a movie, feature theater. And on Fridays, that became Erie Street. Uh, Sunday nights, uh, Gusman Presents. Oh, yeah. That I was, that was that. a big thing, you know. <laughs> so you go back and you think of all those um, different programs and how they came about. But basically, after 1030, you hit the movie, and then, you know, midnight, 1.30, 1 or 1 o'clock, 1.30, that was it. Then it was sign-off. So that's the way things went. All right, now I'm going to ask Alexander of Erie Street from WBAY-TV2, did you ever watch TJ and the Ant? Um, no. Yes, <laughs> no, yes, I it. did. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember whether I not watched it while you're actually on, I'm sure I did. I'm sure I did. <laughs> I don't remember. But I do remember watching you. I seriously do. I was, I was a kid in high school. Mm -hmm. It was uh, 1972. I, did, I graduated from high school in 73. So I was a, a junior, senior, whatever, in high school and when, when you were on television. Now I would say, Doug, you know, that I did watch because I was interested in uh, the logistics of how this was going to happen. And... Uh, I remember, you know, your, uh, your breaks and the stuff that you were doing, uh, the opens. Well, I'm sure I did, because that would have been one of my interests in seeing how that went. And I was still, you know, working at uh, the station oh, yeah. until yep. oh, late 84, early 85, before uh, myself and two partners, uh, we left uh, to create the agency. Cool. That's a great story, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm glad to see you're still alive and doing well. Doug, thank it's you. been a long time that we've been working together. I've known uh, Doug for, oh, I think going back to 89. See, stop your complaining, will you? Just kind of keep it down a little bit. There's people watching. Uh, that's <laughs> going to have to live with it, Doug. <laughs> Thanks again, Alexander from Erie Street on WBAY TV 2, 19, well, 72 to 73 then, for sure. For sure. Yeah. For sure. A long time ago. Thanks again, Al. You bet. It's time for the answer to this episode's mystery picture. Remember, the image was taken in 1978. It is something that is usually found hanging on a wall. There should be one in every home, boat, camper, or building. In some cases, it's required by law to have one on hand. And it's something you hope you'll never need. The answer? It was a fire extinguisher. Well, that's going to almost wrap it up for this episode. And by the way, the Ant Cam will continue to be out and about tracking down historic Green Bay television icons. In addition to stories from Bob Schultz and Tom Hutchinson, we'll chat with Jay Zoller, the current general manager of WLUK TV 11, and a retired director from TV 11, Ron Schultz. And by the way, Ron was the guy that taught me how to run master control at TV 11. And the Ant Cam will also be featuring stories of the Green Bay TV news icon, Tom Zelaski. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this episode of The Ant. And if you keep watching, I'll keep them coming. See you next time. Hey, we've got the Ant.